that we've been together. Uh, the objective of today's session, uh, this session is part of all the thematic conversation we already did this year on analysis, but today it's quite specific because I wanted to structure in a way that is more uh, lessons learned and a sort of open forum to discuss with you very practically about protection analysis update. Um, so I expect still from me a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes uh, of presenting some Aspect. I will be very quick because I assume that many of those are familiar to the majority of the people that are in uh, in uh, in the conversation today. And then, what I wanted to put more the accent on my side is sharing with you some learning uh, that we have on supporting the uh, operation with protectionalist update. So, some best practice, some uh, solutions that we found to common challenge and so on. And then I will uh, pass. Uh, the baton to a colleague from South Sudan, Dorian, uh, because we have been learning last year uh, quite extensively on how we could use protection monitoring better for protectionalist update. So I'll ask uh, Dorian to give us uh, a bit the uh, um, overview of what they've been doing in South Sudan, because I know that many of you also have that question. Uh, so as you can see from the agenda, I will just go through the basics of the protection analysis update show a bit of key takeaways from uh, the last three years that we've been working together on those. Uh, then I would link a bit, but very shortly, the PAU with the process of analysis related to the humanitarian project cycle, and, uh, and then doing uh, a refresher of um, the different five chapters of the PAU and more or less uh, a, a small explanation on those. Um, I will be quick because I assume that many of you already follow this. So I really ask everybody to stop me, ask clarification and so on, because my idea is to, as usual, leave a good 40 minutes, one hour to listen to you. So to actually have this as an open forum, you know that I'm the person that normally is supporting you in revising professionalist updates. So I would like to, to offer the opportunity to ask me directly on specific challenges and we can discuss it together. So if uh, there is no initial burning question, I probably will start digging into the presentation of today, but let me pause for one second. Is there any question or initial comment? Otherwise, I will ask for a roundup of thumbs so I know that I can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. So let's go into it. Um, one thing that I forgot, as usual, I will do the presentation in English, but if there is any need to ask questions or clarification in French or Spanish, please do so, and I will answer back uh, uh, in the same language. So let's go to the very quick. So the um, basics of the PAU. So the PAU, the Protectionalist Update, has been introduced three years ago. Um, in a recognition that we as a sector need to provide uh, uh, protection of situation analysis to the whole community. So the goal of the protection analysis update is to call the attention specifically to protection risks and violations and uh, use this analysis to inform uh, strategy planning. So from the protection strategy work that you follow up, on the, on the relation with partners, the engagement of the SCCG and the engagement of other actors. And I have to say that compared to three years ago when we started, we are in a fact much better place in having the possibility of presenting protection risks. And this year, as you know, we are linking them much more with the humanitarian project cycle. So if the PAUs, the protection analysis update has been, the initial goal was to present protection situation analysis beyond the HPC, this year we are working with you, so to use it much more consistently in the HPC process, but we are going to see it afterwards. The other two major aspects of the protectionalist update, I have often this discussion with IAM colleagues, is it offers us the opportunity to present analysis even in the absence of data. So oftentimes we tend not to, we tend to not report if we don't have data, we don't feel confident, but at the level of the sector as GPC, as protection cluster, we agree that the protectionalist update can be based on qualitative information, can be based in value judgment or in exercises done with partner and subnational coordinator when necessary. 
Uh, and uh, the, lastly, we are going to use them, as you will see from some of the takeaways, for advocacy a mid-year when donors, they decide the funding allocation, but we use them consistently in protection briefings, in private, private briefing and so on. So the scope of the PAU for us has been always very important to elevate the situation of your countries. We introduce uh, some uh, criteria. Uh, so we have a page limitation. Uh, we don't, even if we have our list of 15 protection risks, uh, the goal of the PAUs is to show the critical one. Then we will show some challenges around that. But to present consistently the top five critical protection risks for the period that the PAU covers. And uh, then we have been working on the format uh, to ensure that the executive summary and response and the recommendation, they are almost consistent all the time. So with these donors and other actors, they know what to expect from us. And uh, we're leaving much more space to the protection risk section and to the context section. And um, we have internal publishing criteria and, and, and SOP to ensure that it's consistent. Um, as you have seen in the entire interaction, but I share it with everybody, we have been quite flexible then in, uh, in going about the PAUs, but we managed last year for the first time to have all PAUs using the same format, the same process, the same language, and actually was very appreciated uh, at global level and by donors. There is guidance you can find in the website. So there are two formats, one long and one short. Uh, there is a guidance on definition of protection risks. Uh, there is a guidance on how to basically structure the protection risk section in the PAUs uh, and with a tutorial that links it with the protection analytical framework. And also there is a guidance on how to use the entire format visually with logo and uh, with graphs and so on. So this package is available in the website uh, and recently, which I did add here, we published uh, a human right matrix that we developed with OCHR that links the risk with human right violation. So also for, for, for use of the language. Um, a bit of takeaways from last year, uh, from the last three years. This is the number of professionalist update that has been published. Um, as you can see, 2022 was a, a high level uh, production, but from the GPU, there were two specific stuff that were supporting in the drafting. And last year, we you have been actually uh, taking the, the biggest load of drafting, and we have been intervening in support. Uh, but it's uh, still consistent across operations. The interesting thing that I wanted to show with you that in itself doesn't mean much, but it's an interesting highlight is we have seen over the year, in the last three years, through our website, that the average download of uh, PAUs was 131 downloads, as you can see, in 2021. And last year, and it's increased, this is from January, uh, we have around 800 downloads per each PAU, which is extremely interesting. It doesn't, of course, tell us the full, uh, full outreach, but it shows you that all the work and investment that we have been doing, it's paying the price because donors and external actors are going to those more and more and more. One thing that is important for 2023 is that all operation has been consistent in, uh, in, in showcasing five protection risks uh, and using the same approach and methodology. Um, I wanted to show you some practice uh, around challenges. So this is based on specific uh, PAUs that has been published last year. Uh, because even if the protection analysis update is a situational update, it's quite flexible and you can adapt it to different uh, conversation or needs in country. So we have been having um, protection analysis update published that we're just looking at one of the specific area of responsibility analysis for all risks. So we had an HLP one that we're using the language of the protection risks, identifying five top risks that are not naturally, for instance, HLP, but they were looking, we're doing a full analysis of HLP related issues with those five risks. So, so this is, an, this is a, a possibility when you develop a PAU. So a PAU doesn't have to be necessarily, it has, we have to have a national one, but this is one other possibility that has been explored in the past by operation. Another um, avenue followed by some operation is to actually identify five protection risks, but present one structural driver because they, want, they wanted to use it for strong advocacy. One of the examples you see there, is how the absence of rule of law in the country has an influence to all five risks. So while the analysis was focused on identifying the risks, 
the presentation of the PAU was based on a core aspect that the, the operation felt it was important to highlight in the conversation with other sectors. We have had fully qualitative PAUs, so PAUs that were not based on data, but has been based on uh, consultation with the national partners. Here is one example of people with disability. So there has been several workshops and consultation with the national, uh, with national organization working with people with disability, and the outcome of that workshops has been crafted in a protection analysis update. So as you can see, there is also the possibility of doing fully qualitative PAUs. There has been PAUs that focus on uh, uh, a, a thematic that was more advocacy oriented. So in the country, the protection cluster has been trying to work with the HCT to propose to work on durable solutions. So there has been a PAU that was specifically linked to the risks that are impact or they, they, they curb durable solutions. So there's another avenue, taking a big advocacy aspect in the country and build an analysis that contribute to that. There has been a brief PAU, so the five pages one, so very short one, on either sudden event, so an event that happened and we had to produce a very brief protection analysis in a very short time, or to raise an attention on a thematic that not necessarily falls into the priority protection risk when we discuss with partners. So as you can see, this is one example of a brief PAU developed on uh, the, the LGBTQ plus uh, population and the protection risk affecting that specific uh, uh, group. Uh, lastly, the last two, there has been sensitive context. So protection analysis update that has been developed with partners and so on, but we didn't publish them. We didn't share them widely, but we use them consistently in private briefing to donors, to member states and other actors, even in countries. And then at last, there has been several PLUs that has been focusing on one region, one geographic area in the country. Some have been a brief, so five, six pages of a protection analysis update on one region. Some other, they were long protection analysis update because it was important to highlight the situation of that specific area. So the cluster and the operation decided to go to a much more uh, geographic approach. And I stopped there. I wanted to show you possibilities that actually come from practice uh, to actually open now for a bit the, the over to you for any question or any yeah any comment. Kasia? It's not a comment. I just wanted to really understand because you know we, we, I think for us as we're as we're uh, starting to think about our power, we will definitely need to. I want to discuss also with our AORs this coming Monday. So can you repeat the the first uh, area of how the specific area of responsibility analysis of, of common pro protection risks? How sure. how what was the practice that um, so far? What do we mean after that bullet? Thanks. So we had, uh, uh, I think we had two, but one of these that is prominent is um, it was supported by the House Land and Property Area of Responsibility. So it was a full protection analysis update developed by the House Land and Property Area of Responsibility together with us. And it was looking at the risks, but from an House Land and Property perspective. So the analysis, I can share the example afterwards following up on the call. They were basically so the risks were not the typical one of house land and property because we had attack like you might have in Ukraine, but they were analyzing the driver and the effect from an house land and property perspective. And this it was actually a conversation we are also having right now with the AUR at a global level that sometimes we could have our own protection analysis update where we look at the critical risks, but then if there is a need of a focus PAU on child protection on those same risks, that would be great because then we could use them complementarily. So our PAU is what it shows to all the other sector, the critical risks, but then we can dig into much better on an area, an area of work. That's an answer, please. Yes, and then the second bullet point would would be when, for example, we have we have a P, we have the POW that looks into the say this five prioritized critical protection risks, and say for example one of this is child protection specific risk without child protection uh, issues, but then there is this one um, one let's say um, specific issue that is coming all across five critical protection uh, protection uh, risks identified. Is this what we mean by that? Okay, cool. Cool, yeah. cool. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, on this I will 
I will on this case I will uh, touch afterwards because okay. I actually I actually aggregated the most common question I received, and this is one of the questions, and how the some of the solutions we applied that we can discuss together. Cool. Is there any other comment? Thank you, Kazi. Any other reflection? Any other case that we didn't explore? As usual, I can ask a thumbs up if we can continue, or if there is any need of another space there for questions. It's also for me to verify that you are there. I don't see any thumbs up. Hmm. Thank you, Enoch. Thank you, Mohammed. <laughs> OK, so uh, here for the one that participated to the core session this year in that we did one month ago, on the revised process of analysis for HPC. I wanted to just go back to it very quickly and showcase when would be ideal to have a protection analysis update. If you remember last year, we were saying that we will need at least two protection analysis update per year, and then the frequency can be adjusted. What we have been trying to introduce this year is a much more structured approach, whereby it will be very, very, very important to have a protection analysis update by May and June, for two specific reasons. One is, is the moment where OCHA and uh, the intersectoral process are defining the scope for the HNO. So it's the best moment to present a strong analysis. But normally June, May, June is also the moment where global donors are doing their allocation of funding. It seems counterintuitive, but they don't do the allocation. Many of them, they don't do the allocation of, of, of funding when the HNO is published, but they do it a mid-year. So it's extremely strategic for us to have protection analysis update that are developed in the first between now and June, and then they are published in June. So this is to reiterate that we have been looking into that strategically. Of course, each context and each country can adapt the process, but that would be the most uh, strategic approach in order to inform uh, then the HNOs. Um, the way that has been work. So what we we propose on the way to do protection analysis is actually built on the best practice from all of you. Um, we have been introducing in March the global protection updates prioritization and admin one. So you could use that survey as a starting point of looking at the severity of the different risks. And then what we have seen that can work very well is an exercise of prioritization and then a second exercise of validation and update of the analysis. The process that were the smoothest were when this prioritization was done at a subnational level and then at the capital level was aggregated. So I'm also sharing that as a lessons learned. Sometimes the problem when we had problem of, of PAUs that lasted too long or we had problem of agreement or disagreement is where we centralized this only in the capital and we didn't um, and we just based that on a workshop looking directly at prioritization. So these are two lessons learned as well uh, that we've been introducing. We are in touch with many of you, but the ideal process is to use a certain survey that does that prioritization before a workshop, may get in the majority of partners and use the, those results then to inform a workshop of prioritization. Um, let me pause there for a bit. Uh, otherwise, then I now will enter a bit on uh, the format and uh, some of the challenges of last year. Is there any questions so far? It's all clear. Yeah, many of you have been involved. I see the participants. Uh, Carly or Carmine, I don't know if you wanted to raise the thumbs up or you wanted to ask some question. Sorry, my bad. All good. It's Carmen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, so let me go on this because uh, I think it would be good to have the reflection after the presentation of protection monitoring. So. If I look at all my past year support, there has been four major questions that has been progressively uh, that we progressively received. So here I just really link, write the four question. And just give you some of the troubleshooting, how we had, how we respond to those and how we adapted them to publish the PAU. So the first one is 
you know that we have 15 definitions. Those 15 definitions has been agreed uh, between AUR and GPC. Uh, but one of the major questions is what if we need to change a definition? Why do we need to adapt it? So um, these are the three major troubleshootings, so the three major solutions that we came with practice. One is that so it comes without saying every time you have that problem, don't force it too much, come back to us. And we always found a solution. So we found a way to adapt the definition in a way that is, is consistent with the language of protection risk but it's also acceptable in the country. There has been no case on the old 22 PAUs of last year where we didn't find a solution. So uh, that's doable. The second is we strongly advise that you use method terminology that is common in the country, that if you have dialogue or that type of terminology is used in the country, as long as it captures the same situation of risks, I use that terminology. Here I put an example that is coming from Mozambique where the, the forced return, which is the way we define our risks, they have been presenting the analysis, but for them it was important to define it as involuntary and induced returns in adverse circumstances, because the language used there was this one. And we recently had one with, uh, with uh, Palestine, for instance, where forced force displacement, the language used in the country is forcible transfer. So using the language in country is absolutely recommendable. And we can look together in uh, how to adapt it and help you out. The other major problem is sometimes uh, there are these general, there is this tendency of presenting general risk, child protection risks, conflict related risks. And um, in those cases, uh, uh, the solution we found is always to put the highlight in one driving risk, even in the title. So here you can see an example where multiple protect child protection risks were important. And the solution we found is to, because the analysis was given that, is to actually show that forced child separation was the key driver compounded by children exposure to violence, abuse, and neglect, including alleged forced recruitment and trafficking. So if you can see in the rest of the definition, there are the other risks, but we clarify what drives and what are the effects. Please stop me at any time eh? if it's not clear. And then there is the, of course, the ongoing question because we have five in the protection sector. We are so rich. We have five areas of work. So how do we present child protection, GBV, my action and HLP issue? If there is no, across the prioritized risk, there is no risk that is specifically related to those areas of work. <laughs> so one uh, solution that we have found across operation is include the analysis, so the child protection analysis, the GBV analysis, HLP, across risks. Because I think that we can all agree that risks are not isolated, they work together. So for instance, in a situation where you have attacks on civilians, even if the risk is attacks on civilian, you have child protection consequences and effect, GBV, HLP, and so on. So work together with the AUR to look together at those risks. The second is, start engaging with the colleagues of the AUR from the definition of the scope of the protection analysis update. Sometimes where we have much more problematic uh, situation is where when we decided the scope, we decided in, in a way we did the prioritization and then we engage. But sitting down at the very beginning, what is strategic in terms of the scope? When I mean the scope is what should be the message of the PU, how should be structured and so on, that will help us out in, uh, in, uh, in uh, ensuring that the analysis from all areas of all our works are, uh, are actually reflected across the PAU. Then again, this I go back with the, uh, what we, the, the, the example before. If there is no agreement or sometimes we don't reach an agreement on the priority risks and there is some tension there, we can have a protection, a, 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 um, protection analysis update published as protection cluster with the most critical risks. But if there is any necessity to actually dig deeper and present a stronger analysis, for instance, on HLP, there could be another PAU that is developed together with the, the AUR colleagues uh, that look at the same risk, but it shows the all HLP consequences. This actually is very helpful, not just only to, to come to an agreement, to have a stronger analysis, but even when we present externally to the other sectors, because then we can use the critical risks as our common narrative but we can still show deeper analysis of the different areas of work. Um, this is a fundamental question that I received 
basically every time. What if we have more than five critical potential risks? Um, so one solution that we found across is that sometimes one risk is driving all the others. So it's a structural risk. So it happens attacks, for instance, when there is a bombardment and so on. That when a, when a risk is a clear driver of all the other, you can elevate it to the context. So you have one risk in the context that is explained as a structural driver of all the other risks. So that gives you the space to actually focus on the, the one that are more the concentrated one. Um, the, another solution we found is that again, protection risks are not acting in isolation. So you may have, for instance, attacks, presence of mine, and uh, force and family separation. So assuming, for instance, in a generic context that attacks is the priority risk. In the analysis, we can present the other risks. So the effects in terms of presence of mine, how this impacted the population, and the compounded effect on, for instance, forced family separation. So we actually, the risks are not in isolation. The prioritization is fundamental for us to understand how to strategize. But then in the analysis, you can actually use the other risks to explain what are the effects. And then again, I go back to, this is another solution we found, additional protectionalism update. So you might have one uh, that is our main protectionalism update that shows the five top risks in the country, but then we can have a, a brief one that dedicates only to one risk and it enters in more detail into that analysis, or one risk that has not been included in the five risks. So you can use also those flexibly. This is the simpler. Uh, what if we have to write more than 15 pages? Uh, my, my always comment is don't do it because it's not read, and I've seen it and proven all last year. Uh, but if sometimes it's necessary. So the major solution we found is there is many information sometimes that can be presented as annex. So an annex to the PAU is also a good way to use the document strategically because the PAU can help you out in, for instance, organizing a meeting with a donor or with the HCT and so on. And during that meeting, you can use the additional information that you have developed to present it and to present much more deeper information. Has been the case, for instance, for the response section, which many of you, I mean, having one page to show the response is a bit limited, but as we see, because in the PAU, we want to be very precise. So, the whole detailed dashboard of what do we do and so on, we have been using those uh, as annexes most of the time. Um, or specific thematic consideration we wanted to include in MPU, we, we, we included as annex. Let me pause there. Um, let me give a pause one second. Um, does, I have a question. Do you do any of these solution? Maybe I already answered with some of the challenges you had. I will ask you about challenges afterwards, but uh, there is any reaction uh, or comment or question? Yes, Francesco, it's Julian uh, for the Afghanistan Protection Cluster. <clears throat> um, for, on the on the 15 pages, uh, I have a question for Annex. For example, for example, uh, we have five risk. Uh, risks, uh, too many, too much information on, for example, two or three risks. Uh, can it be in an, an annex uh, by a section by protection risk or not really? Thank you. Ah, that's interesting. My initial reaction would say yes, meaning that in the PAU, a less one risk, you really want to show and put an accent to one specific risk, then it can be in terms of space, much bigger than the others, so require more analysis. My general comment would be that in the PAU, they should be balanced. Okay, so if there is any additional, much deeper analysis, surely it can go in an annex. Uh, I would say yes, and it can be presented as, you know, the deeper analysis or much more evidence with much more resources. So I would say yes. Okay, thank you. And the annex could have uh, several risks detailed or not? But if it becomes, pay attention not to have it as another PAU. Maybe <laughs> that my question is, yeah, we, maybe we can look at that bilaterally together. I would st still structure it in a way 
that it doesn't become longer than uh, than uh, than the PAU, but it can be strategically structured. So ideally, yes, but we have to look into that. I okay, mean, you are you. you yeah, you don't have to list to add two documents with speaking about different risks or even the same risk with different information. That that will be my to be cautious on that. Okay, thanks a lot. Any other reflection, Alexandros? Please. Nice to see you here. Hi, Francesco. Um, uh, joining from from Greece, I have finished with the Afghanistan operation. Maybe I have a question that could support colleagues that are still working on the PAU in Afghanistan. Do you think that, like you know, that in the last period we were working on uh, softening the language that we are using when it comes to the protection activities and response, um, so that we can make it more, if I can say, friendly to be using meetings that we have with uh, with DFA and be like more approachable to them. Do you, uh, do you see any kind of implication? Because we know that, for instance, the AOR, I'm not sure if colleagues from the GBV AOR are connected to the meeting today, but we know that they have um, expressed again and again some, you know, reservations, some concerns about the issues raised and the language used so that this would not provoke um, the, the DFA like in the future or whomever would read that a report that wouldn't be uh, donors or other, like let's say, protection um, uh, stakeholders. Um, do you see a necessity or an added value in using the same softened, let's say, protection language in the PAU, or do you think that this is something that is totally separate and colleagues should reflect exactly in the anticipated, if I can say, protection language, the risks mm -hmm. that we have identified and we see um, as priority uh, for the first PAU for 2024. Thank you and over. Uh, thank you, Alexandro. Um, let me, uh, and there is a baby, a baby, a baby, sorry for me mispronouncing. Let me add an initial reaction uh, and then I just shut it back for reflection also from other colleagues. Um, I think that if we have to soften too much the language on a PAU, um, we have to look at actually the details. Uh, so, it would not be a PAU anymore, so because it's uh, we are gonna reduce the the actual objective of showing the violation and the protection of risk related to that. Solution we had in the past is to do it with a good language and work and share it privately. So that's one solution. Um, other solution that we had, for instance, in Mozambique or in other countries that is less political than Afghanistan, is yes, we soften the language to not use strong. Human right related language, but we still define it as a professional risk. So there is a work there to do in uh, 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 on the language, but we can work on it. Otherwise, if it's really watering down a lot the language, my suggestion is we either do it private as a private PAU and then we share it privately instead of public, or we find alternatives. But I don't know if I understood well the question, uh, uh, but over back for reflection on others. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Abebe, am I pronouncing that properly? Thank you very much, Francisco. I mean, you pronounce very well. Uh, <laughs> this is Abebe Ayana from Ethiopia. Uh, I have one question regarding to prioritization of uh, five critical protection risks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, how to measure I mean, the likelihood and impact of I mean, a specific protection risk to compare other risks. Maybe some protection risk have I mean, a huge impact, uh, but uh, less frequently happen. Thank you, and over. Oh, thank you for that, Rabebe. Um, I don't think I can answer fully, uh, but maybe we can follow up bilaterally. Uh, Two, three things that we've been introduced, again, building on lessons learned is, one, we have been introducing criteria uh, that we have been working together with the area of responsibility for each of the 15 risks for a better comparability. And uh, the second aspect is um, we are looking less at probability likelihood, but we are, more, we are looking much more into uh, the direct consequence that we observe through data um, as our preliminary analysis for prioritization. So the prioritization exercise is not based on what is the likelihood of the protection is to happen, but is what is the risk that has been impacting the people so far. So it's less a forecasting analysis, it's more a descriptive one. 
Uh, but I, maybe I leave it there and uh, we can follow up bilaterally if it's okay for you, unless uh, you would like to, 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 to have a further conversation. Thank you. But that's a great, great question. <laughs> Any other comments so far? Uh, Alexandro Gillian, I don't know if my answer, my reflection on your comment was okay, or if you want to put it better more. Please, Alexandro. No, I am fully, fully agree we're on the same page. I'm just wondering if, because we did the whole kind of an attempt, an exercise to make sure before going to a meeting with the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, that we soften the language to the extent that the, the, the activities that are implemented uh, under the protection cluster are welcomed in a way by the, by the DFA. And, uh, even softening the language when we speak about GVB, speaking about women and, and their families, yeah. which yeah. doesn't necessarily reflect um, uh, the, the risks per se, the protection risk per se. So I'm just wondering whether uh, it would make sense to keep them like separate, or mm -hmm. as you rightfully said, have an internal version or an external version of the yeah. PAU that wouldn't like say put at unnecessary risk, but the operation or the protection cluster has done already, has achieved already in very, um, you know, in very challenging um, circumstances in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. That would only be my, my concern yeah, yeah. in the office, but I totally yeah. leave it with uh, the colleagues that are, uh, will, will uh, go on and uh, finalize the PAU in Afghanistan to, to decide on what's the best way forward. Um, over, thank you, Francesco. No, thank you, thank you, Alessandro. I mean, one thing is we did, they did, sometimes a internal and external PAU, so that's doable. But you say something that I, I actually made a mistake. One thing is the language of the PAU, the other is the language when we present the PAU to authorities and other actors. In the presentation, we are absolutely flexible to use the best language possible. So that's also, we are actually working uh, the second part of the year to improve and support you on how to present it, because the presentation does have to adapt to the context. So that those are other considerations. But I forgot to say, when I was referring to not being a PAU, it's on the document. So the document, yeah, we can do those different solutions, internal, external, one private, or maintain the language, but then the presentation, yeah, is understood. Thank you. Any other burning question? Otherwise, I still have, uh, now I'm going to go through the five chapters again to do a very quick overview. Many of you heard me a lot. Uh, but I'm happy to do it quickly so then uh, our colleague Dorian can give us a bit of input on professional monitoring and open a bit on questions. Are there any other comments so far? Sometimes up. Thank you. So the I will go very quickly on this. Uh, there is another webinar uh, on this. So, but again, I'm going chapter by chapter. So, because we actually had a strategic approach when we thought about the format. So I want to go through again it very quickly. Executive summary, one page, absolutely not beyond the one page. Even if it's one paragraph going beyond, our suggestion is to bring it back to one page uh, because honestly, it's the, it's the page most read. And it's a page that you can use it very easily. Sometimes you can share only just that. So structurally, well, the executive summary is extremely important because sometimes it's the only page that uh, specifically high level actors they look at. Uh, when we include the, the context update, uh, there is no need of giving the histories, the background on anything on the, on the country, but really focus from the first paragraph of the most important update for the period. What happened in the last period that is extremely essential to read through. So don't be concerned of presenting the contest, presenting the country and so on. This will be somewhere else and we can actually share another document that gives the history. Here really the first two paragraphs, they, can, they should drive on the attention of what happened or that is extremely important to focus the protection, the attention to in the last period. And uh, this is an example that you can find in the template, but I will not go there but uh, showing, for instance, what is the, the last part. Then presenting the five risks, no need to add description and highlighting they are there, so they are very visible. And then uh, two, three top most urgent action needed. Sometimes uh, in the last two years, uh, these are confused with the recommendation. And sometimes since these are confused with the recommendation, there is a need of putting 10 or 15. 
But here the reality is of sort of the two top three asks for that period. They can be some of them in the recommendation, but normally they can be coming from the recommendation. This can be drafted as advocacy message. Um, they can be precise on one specific region, but really, really, what are you trying to, to ask uh, to the external people that look at the analysis? Then they will look at the detailed recommendation, but what are the two top things that you, we are asking? And really focus on that. Um, then on the severity, uh, one thing that we suggest not to do is to add the severity table of the HNO, specifically for now, for instance, we are in March, already not to add that table by itself because it's already far in time, but try to ask the, the, the IAM colleagues to show variation, to show what changed, uh, even if we, we add the, the table that we use in the last HNO, if a long time passed, showing some additional layer of other information. So that table should, of course, be linked on that severity, but should be much better structured. Uh, and one of the things that we do, knowing that you can't redo all the severity calculation over and over and over, uh, adding at the end a table where even by value judgment, even by internal meeting with partner, you can look into the severity. Even if it's just a workshop with partner at some national level where uh, we have seen like in December, in November, that we put that the severity was three or four, but we feel the situation actually got worse. And it's a pure qualitative table. The idea of it is to drive the attention, not to, you know, and then open a channel, open for the conversation. So the point being, whatever you include in terms of severity in the executive summary, really focus on having an update and sometimes even focus on qualitative update. We don't need strong data to show that because then we're gonna have our analysis that is actually sustaining why in specific region or a specific state, this, we feel that the situation changes. When, uh, please uh, stop me at any time. Eh? When we go to context, uh, um, we have a standard table at the very top. Uh, there is no need of putting only protection data, but the, we, we suggest the most important figures that you think we should show to explain our analysis. So if it's a trend of displacement, it's a trend of displacement. If it's a full security data, it's a full security data. So really, what are the top most significant figures that really in a visual aspect, they gave it already the attention on the driver of the risk that we've been putting into our analysis. And uh, sometimes we just put the numbers, but when you look at the numbers by themselves, is you can't get what does the number mean, unless you have huge numbers. So we always suggest to make an effort to show variation. So variation compared to the last PAU or variation compared to the previous year. So, and also if you have other ideas, better, but try al always not to show absolute number, but to show something that is relevant, some variation, some trend that shows why that figure is important. Then in the structure of the context, uh, uh, this is a very editorial suggestion. Don't do long context. Uh, we have maximum three pages. So um, divide it in section and think strategically at the title of the section. The title of the section, I always say, should be an analysis itself. So here, for instance, steady erosion of livelihood and copy capacity, worrying impacts of poor governance and disruption of community fabrics. So a title that already give a highlight that is sort of an analytical conclusion. This is very helpful for the people that just screen documents. Um, and not add very long, 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 long text uh, without this heading, and, uh, and also, of course, add some graphs. On the graphs and information need, uh, we have seen the tendency sometimes to use our approach of representing protection monitoring data brought to the PAU. So sometimes we have a question and we have percentage of people that answer this, percentage of people that, yeah, that, that answer that. In a PAU, our suggestion is always to either bring trends or correlation or to at least overlay different answers. So something that brings together two pieces of data as a minimum that you can use to justify your analysis. So uh, when I've seen, you have seen in me, but when in the past we had just the graphs, for instance, on how many percentage of people was answering to specific question, we will always suggest to replace those, those type of information because that is good for a protection monitoring report. But when we bring it to the analysis, if we put something visual or some graph, 
it should show some correlation or something that actually sustain the narrative analysis. On the protection of this session, you all know the five risks. Uh, and then for the formulation of the risks, uh, I will not go into the details because there is a tutorial. So the structure of the narrative should be based on the protection analytical framework. So logical threats, consequences, and capacity. Then there are different ways. But then for the headings, uh, um, this goes back to my previous, uh, actually, lessons learned from last year. Avoid general formulation. Uh, we can't have outstanding the property as a risk or violation or all forms of violence. That doesn't tell what is critical. So that might be in our messaging and so on, but not as a title of a risk. Include always, I mean, a man-made factors. A man-made factors means because we're speaking about violations. So when we speak about risk, force, denial, impediments, one of the things that happened at most, most of my work last year is lack of. And the suggestion is to avoid lack of because lack of is not in itself a risk because it's not related to the action behind that. Oh, thank you, Alice. Can you hear me now? I'm back. Yes, I can hear you, but you were it was frozen for a second. I don't know if it's us or if it was, if it was you. So sorry for that. So uh, moving forward. Um, Sometimes there is a uh, important issues in the country is the example, for instance, of food insecurity and malnutrition. In our PAUs, is never the title of a risk because that is another sector situation. But we could frame one of our risks to be linked to that. So it happened in, uh, I remember, I think it was South Sudan two years ago, where there is a, uh, the, 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 there is a food, food insecurity situation and our risks were related to discrimination and denial of resources leading to food insecurity. So it's extremely important not to be driven by one of the most important crises in the, in the country, but link our language with risk with that situation. Um, and then uh, at last, the general contextual events are not risk themselves. So conflict, ongoing violence, occupation. So this means just when we define what the risk is, and it links to the first one, so always avoid generalization. Try to be a bit more precise uh, on uh, what is the driving risks and the finite intensities. Uh, on the response, the response says, this has been, to be honest with all of you, has been the most critical section in all of the work we did last year, uh, because of course we had a tendency to present the response monitoring. 45W, show everything we do, we did across the area of responsibility. If we show one area, we have to show the other. I, we know all of that situation. But as I say before, this section should be very, very analytical in a sense. We are presenting the risks. We are telling these are the critical risks. So the response section should be, what are we doing as protection actor that is positively contributing to the risk we identified? So what progress? And it can be strategic and can be tactic. So for instance, there has been one area of the country where we have been increasing community-based approaches and it's actually been effective. And we want to actually advocate for that community-based approach to be extended in another area of the country. So this, I will focus the progress into that. So. In this area, in this area, we have been implementing community-based approach with this methodology and it contributed to mitigated risk in this and the other way. So really progress, not response monitoring, but important progresses in relation to the risk. So these help, help us out in presenting in the second part. Okay, we are doing progresses, but we have this problem in terms of accessing population. So it can be physical, it can be related even to funding, but this is, even if we are doing our best as a sector, our partner are doing their best, the AOR are doing the best, we still have these challenges. And, and this helps in uh, presenting the last part, which are the critical gaps, which I always say the critical gaps should not just be financial. Donors, they hear you on financial gaps all the time. So they can be financial, but what is really critical? So for instance, with the example of community approaches. Yeah, we would like to extend that, but community approaches are not prioritized in uh, SER funding, for instance, or in a uh, pool fund. So that is, so what is 
that has to be changed, that it's a critical gaps in order for us to be much more effective in addressing and mitigating the risks. So I stop there on the response. I just pause one second. I know that this is the more, the less intuitive for the way we work, but the bottom line is anything that is response monitoring can be presented as an annex and can be presented as an additional aspect to this section. In this section, really doing an effort with also the AOR colleagues and the partner to really focus and see what progress we want to show, what barrier we still have, what gaps we still need to address. That also can help us out in funding. It can, can help us out in expanding type of activities. And I will, let me stop there. The last part of the recommendation, uh, Key recommendation, I always suggest that for each risk, we can't have a list of 25 recommendations for the same logic. They have to be critical, they have to be important. If there are more recommendations, again, an annex. So here we can include the important, the important one, what we think are the most critical one, and then we can have a much more detailed document of recommendation. That's always my suggestion. Organize them against the risks. This uh, in 2020 seconds seems to be problematic, but all last year, all of you didn't find uh, all operation didn't find any problem in linking them to the risk. So that's I think that we can skip that. But there is still something on the recommendation that I always suggest we should advance on. Sometimes the, the crisis are not changing, so we always have the same recommendation. And we, sometimes we tend to do general recommendation, um, many general recommendations. Even when they are general, our suggestion is to do two things, to do an effort to link very well the target. So this maybe is a recommendation that should be taking place by all the humanitarian community, but really include the target because that allows us, allow the external reader to, to, to show that we understand where the, the, the problem, what the issue should be addressed. The second is to add a time bound period. So this should be done by the next six months, by the next quarter, by the next year, because all the wires we will face these consequences. So it's not anymore a general recommendation, but we are actually putting forward what, when we think this should be done. And it doesn't stay as a recommendation that is never implemented. The second is, even if it's a general recommendation for that specific period, where in the country is more important. So, uh, we need to improve these or to ensure this specifically in this region, this region, and this region. That doesn't mean that we are excluding the other region. That shows that in the last period, we have a good analysis of what happened in the last period. So other recommendations, these are just improvement. We see that we are still, we have still to work together, localizing it, keeping time bound uh, and linking well with the target. I stop there. Um, sorry for that it took long, but I thought it was good to have a refresher on this. Is there any comment or question before I pass to my colleague Dorian uh, for a bit of reflection on protection monitoring? Can you raise your hand if we can continue uh, also to see if you're still there? All clear. Thank you, Billy. Stefan, please. What do you, want, you wanted to give thumbs up. Sorry, it should have been a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. So we will have some some space. Ah, Cassia, please. I don't know if I, mean, I will ask my two questions and tell me if it's better to ask them at the end of the to clarify at the end of the session. One, when you spoke at the beginning of the period of the POW, should we count from the last POW or really focus on the, the, I don't know, the developments in the last months? What's what's best? That's really strategic, uh, meaning that it depends on the time passes from the last PAU. So what I say that would be interesting is just in the figure, in the context, that you could put something from the last PAU or and then another that maybe the last period so you can show some trend. But in terms of the coverage is really strategic. So if you think now that the one that you are publishing in the next couple of months should focus in 2024, focus it in 2024. No need to cover all the events from the last one. Cool. And then the second one is like thinking, you know, how we will organize the process um, 
in Ukraine. <coughs> Just to make it clear, you when in the one of the previous workshops you were and also with the GPU we shared this table like with the subnational analysis quantitative to which there could be some qualitative analysis also added in how we prioritize risk. Just to confirm, because that's something I'm planning to Absolutely. share with the subnational coordinators, and this is something you would also support, right, and uh, help us out in case we need to train a subnational coordinators on the yes. 15 risks, etc. A little bit, right? Absolutely, because that actually, the, what we introduced with the GPU at Admin 1 was a lessons learned from the PAU of last year. Many of you told us that prioritizing risk is extremely difficult because you have AORs, you have partners, you have different opinions and so on. And in those two, three countries where we actually did that at subnational level using some sort of quantitative survey helped because then the conversation at capital level was starting from something. So. So the introduction of the GPU is exactly for that objective. This year, and it's a suggestion that we had for everybody, use the GPU we did to start the PAU process, even at subnational level. So we could start from something, we can have a better prioritization at subnational level, we can bring it at national level. So absolutely. And then we are not we are not discussing this now, but we are, you know that we are revising also the HNO methodology. And one of the things that we are gonna introduce is to use the GPU admin one plus the prioritization for the severity at the end of the year. So you don't have to redo the exercises. So and much very much happy to support on the tools, on the training at subnational level, everything. Uh, I'll get direction. back to you bilaterally because that will need to happen pretty soon. And I'll be in Geneva as well so we can yeah, discuss. Thank Thanks. you, Cassie. Any other question? So if it's OK, then uh, Dorian, over to you. Uh, let me introduce a bit this subject. Uh, many operations have been discussing with us on, uh, and many of you have been reflecting how to revise protection monitoring. Last year, we had Nigeria, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan recently. Uh, I think we're discussing this with Venezuela. So many, many operations, we are in the same process of thinking how to reuse the protection monitoring more and more. and. Um, we have two lessons learned that I wanted to share. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Celia, coming to you. Uh, two lessons learned that I wanted to share from last year is one is that we have to find a way to categorize the question and the information in the protection monitoring to be, be more usable for the PAU. So that's a big lessons learned. Sometimes it's very difficult to use the protection monitoring information for the PAU simply because the PAU use the path categories and the risk, while the protection monitoring sometimes it doesn't. So that is a fundamental lesson learned that we had. And the second is that the process of the PAU can help us out in rationalizing what we ask. So we don't need sometimes to have these long questionnaires, but we may might need a reduced questionnaire because it's what we need to understand, and then the rest can be on observation and other methodology. So sharing that as the two big lessons learned, and then I, now I pass to Dorian so he can present a bit the work in South Sudan. But before I see, there is a question. Asaidi, if I pronounce it well. Yeah, Francisco, good afternoon, everyone. Ha, am I audible enough? Now, yes. Oh, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Asaidi Abdelgafar Yusuf calling from the northeastern region of Nigeria. Just want to appreciate your effort to say thanks so much because this is an opportunity for us to have this kind of global interaction with regards to the protection uh, intervention in our, uh, in our communities and in our countries of intervention. Uh, just to appreciate the effort and also to, to, to a kind of uh, advocate for many more of this kind of interaction because, of course, we're trying, we been in this call that is actually exposing us to the realities out there. It gives us the opportunity to know what's actually happening globally. And also it's an avenue for us to share ideas. Here we are no more in the emergency. We we are this is we are in post-emergency. And uh, for Bernou State, the government here is actually committed to returning IDPs to their ancestral homes, at least I think I mean uh, come closure. So I I want to say thank you and also want to extend my regards to every partner out there in the protection sector globally. Thank you, Anova. Thank you very much, Saidi. That's very much appreciated. 
<laughs> we are trying to do this effort actually to have more exchanges like this. So it's good to hear that they are helpful somehow because otherwise sometimes we are too detached at our level, at global level. So it's good to hear that. Thank you. Um, Dorian, are you still there? Um, if you are there, I will pass it over to you. I'm here. Thank you. So over to you and I can move the slide for you. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm not sure if this now the slide. Uh, yes, please, uh, please uh, put on the first slide. Uh, is this automated? Because I don't see the text in the. In yeah, OK, all right, thank you. So just to give very, very brief uh, background in South Sudan, we have developed and deployed a protection monitoring system, a key informant non incident based system which looks into uh, 11 uh, protection risks violations groups of, of 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 violations which is done with, with the intention to have an understanding uh, a high level understanding of what is happening in the country on monthly basis and to be able to uh, measure trends and also to be able to advocate not so much at the time uh, on the yearly uh, plannings, but uh, on uh, uh, monthly or seasonal uh, uh, prioritizations due to conflicts, due to floods. So the, the yearly system just did not uh, work for us to be able to be uh, uh, precise. Um, there was a, 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 a big buy-in from the partners on the ground, uh, from the donors. So uh, happy to report that today this system is uh, embedded in the HNO HRP, it's embedded in the needs assessment working group, is uh, taken uh, by the HC as the, um, the, the main uh, source of information for uh, protection. Of course, much more needs to be done, and I will go, go to it uh, 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 next. What I just wanted to show on this first slide um, and comparing it to uh, uh, an, an example of uh, one of the risks is uh, basically the structure of the information needs that we have put together. So the first one is about prevalence, is it happening? The second one is what groups are, uh, par uh, is it happening? And then if it's happening, how much of it is happening? Um, next question, uh, uh, who, what are the groups that are particularly affected? Uh, main reasons for uh, for that particular violations, uh, contributors to those uh, violations, uh, what are in this in particular important for because we are talking about access to human humanitarian access, um, uh, what services are being denied, and what are the actions to address the situation, including negative coping mechanisms by uh, by this community. So when when analyzing the information uh, that is being collected uh, and uh, when uh, uh, creating and not only POW, we also have a monthly system to inform about uh, this uh, uh, protection risk trends. Uh, we look into the scale, of course. We look into the vulnerable groups because that might or might not imply some sort of a targeting. Uh, we need to understand the reasons or contributors that can be addressed by humanitarian actors, political or peace stakeholders, or development actors. Not every single risk or the cause of every single risk is, is something that we can do something about it. So when analyzing, these are kind of, let's say, the questions that we are asking ourselves, what are the data telling us? Uh, links to other clusters, not, uh, so not only links within our own risks, or AORs, but also links to other clusters. Um, and then looking at coping mechanisms, then it, that might increase other risks or usually negative coping mechanisms. Um, then, because this is a key informant interview level, high, very high level uh, uh, data collection, we want also to, uh, for, for, uh, that the results of this analysis triggers or might trigger or, or 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 provide some proof for further investment into uh, deep dives uh, like focal uh, focal group discussions. So it's not FDG, but FGDs, uh, intersectorial rapid needs assessments where uh, and some of the triggers when we look at the data, uh, this and this is still primary data sources, 
uh, late scale occurrences, uh, particularly affected groups uh, with links to negative coping mechanisms, such as, for example, GBV, um, and also uh, urgent need for protection mainstreaming activities, among other clusters, in the, for this particular uh, 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 for this particular risk. Can we go on the next slide, please? Francesco, can we go to the next slide, please? Ah, thank you. Yep. Sorry. So now, um, for secondary data sources, uh, this and now um, we have used secondary data sources before, but not at the level of risk assessment. But we have mostly used it at the level of HNO, HRP analysis. So the the big the big thing. Now we are moving towards uh, uh, including uh, secondary uh, data sources. And this time, as you can see already now in a path structured uh, way. Um, for example, uh, 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 various uh, various uh, type of areas uh, from various uh, different sources to feed into our analysis. Sometimes this can be done in a quantitative way. Sometimes it can be done in a qualitative way. Uh, 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 way, but it is very important to be able to map your secondary data sources. Of course, um, look into um, into uh, their uh, credibility, their uh, uh, shelf life, which is often a problem that we have encountered here. That uh, maybe um, some NGO will publish a report about something that they have assessed four months ago. Um, the relevance of that information might or but probably is not uh, relevant anymore. Um, but also to be uh, uh, to be then uh, talking to uh, to other uh, uh, whether sectorial or or organizational. We lost to Dorian. Your mic. Uh... So yeah, so I'm just going to uh, uh, go back in a nutshell. So now we are looking into structuring our secondary data. So some of them already existing, some of them is in the pipeline, some of them is uh, uh, is fully functional, but we haven't looked at it from the perspective of the path structure. You know, the threats, the characteristics, the consequences, and the capacities. Uh, and in, in in some we are negotiating with some of the uh, prime uh, some of the owners of the data to improve their own data collection or increase their own data collection to uh, to feature some of the needs that we might uh, also have. For example, uh, we are now in talks with CCCM for site population profiling. Um, in in principle, uh, what I was wanted to say here is that the pro the current protection monitoring system that we have is very much close to the way PATH works, protection analytical framework work, but it's not there yet. We are now in the process of, um, of looking at the secondary data sources and mapping it in a way that it feeds uh, and, and, it's, and it's collated in a way that PATH can, uh, can, can, uh, uh, it, it can be, it can be analyzed by using um, we can go to the next slide, please. Can you see it, Dorian? Uh, not yet. Change. Yeah, so uh, with, with the um, protection monitoring system that is already in place. Uh, we have uh, established another important thing, uh, which we call the PROMO, the Protection Monitoring Working Group, which is uh, which consists of uh, at the moment of about 40 protection partners that are engaged in data collection and data analysis. And we are working closely together with them to uh, to serve, and as you can, if you would uh, to to serve as both a data collecting, but also data and information analyzing hub, uh, which also then uh, partially serves also as 
a group which creates a PAL. So very quickly, a protection cluster member is asked to a collect quantitative data through what we will now call PRMS. This in the next couple of months, together with the support from the global protection cluster, we are revising our protection monitoring system to be fully, um, uh, uh, fully uh, harmonized with the 15 protection risk and the analytical framework for every single of the uh, one of those uh, risks and and apart from having the key informant uh, uh, data collection tool we will also be creating focus group discussion rapid need assessment observation methodology harmonized tools that every single protection cluster member will eventually hopefully use and all the data, quantitative data, uh, will be analyzed through the PRMS and provide, uh, of course, visualized through a dashboard, provided as a data source to the needs assessment working group, which then collates it with other clusters to prioritize uh, at the geographical level. We will provide it to PROMO. In parallel, at this particular moment, and I'm sure this is also happening in some other countries as well, uh, together with the Global Protection Cluster and DRC, we, uh, there is a deep project that is uh, providing a new, uh, uh, another uh, useful tool, which is, uh, which is fully aligned with the path, where quantitative information are being stored and tagged. Uh, uh, today, this morning, we had the first training of our partners in the field, and they also this will uh, happen in, a, in, in the months to come. So what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve that the promo, which is here at the center of the graph, this group of people, uh, receives quantitative data, of course, analyzed data with suggestions, and will uh, receive qualitative uh, data, and be and and by having both in a single, let's say, on 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 a single editorial desk, is able to not only create the pause but create something that we call Spotlight. It's a monthly, it's a small, it's a mini power, which gives us even more freedom of selection. So we can uh, look at the uh, information and data uh, horizontally, vertically, geographically, thematically. We don't even need always to bring to the front the highest risks. We can, gives us this flexibility to say, okay, this month we want to talk maybe of some smaller risks, but we will dedicate this document uh, 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 to that. Um, feeds other reporting and activities, feeds the HNRP narrative, because uh, if you have, um, if, if you are following trends, then you also, you, are, you, you, you pretty much have 80% uh, of your HNRP uh, 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 re ready to go before the HNRP even starts. Um, it helps us, of course, with the global advocacy, making, uh, making sure that all our dashboards and the documents are published on the global website. Uh, uh, every doc, every piece of information or data can be filtered down to national and subnational coordinator uh, level, even we at le admin level three. So, uh, so, so field coordination level can basically filter down and look only at their geographical areas. AORs can only look at certain thematic areas, but filtering through. Um, of course, we are looking into um, ways how in the future we might do some comparisons with five W's, which might give indications of impact yet to be seen. Uh, and of course, it will help us by ident identifying HNRP needs and targeting from the thematic point of view. What areas, and not only from a geographical point of view, but also thematic point of view, uh, we, we are, will be able to, uh, to support uh, uh, the best. So it's quite complex, it's quite large, but it so far has, uh, uh, we, are, we are on the way. Uh, we haven't uh, reached this, what you can see here, but uh, we are confident that uh, this year we will, we, will, we will have that and be able to support uh, the PROMOS, meaning this, this group, uh, uh, assessment group with both qualitative and quantitative data, which is structured, and this is very important in a way that it can be uh, uh, assessed uh, uh, by using uh, uh, the, the framework uh, that, that the global protection cluster is uh, pushing to.
So um, also just was one final word before any uh, uh, questions. Um, the importance of it is that we are trying to make it light and fast, as light as possible and as fast as possible. So far, this uh, uh, gave us a lot of credibility. Second parenthesis, last year, when doing HNO, uh, uh, we, the, uh, the protection monitoring system was our source of information for probably about 70% of, uh, of, uh, of our uh, assessments. And it took away a huge cost for household level assessments across the country. In protracted situations, this is not needed, maybe every couple of years, but it really is not needed to be done uh, every year. So it took a big load of, of the, the, the general humanitarian, uh, uh, let's say, efforts in collect, collecting data. And yes, as Francesco said before, we also do rely occasionally, whether thematically or ge geographically, on uh, rapid desk reviews with key people uh, 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 on the ground. Not everything can always be quantified. There are issues uh, of various sources, but as long as the quantification and the desk review is done in accordance with the framework, uh, we so far have not experienced any problem and troubles or, or have received any pushback by people from the PID by saying that we are misrepresenting the situation. Thank you. Over to you, Francesco. Thank you very much, Dorian. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> I want to open for questions, but before um, that, just one comment that I think is an important one for everybody. Uh, South Sudan doesn't have huge IAM resources. So it's just Dorian. So one other thing that I wanted to highlight is, uh, one other thing that I found interesting is, that this organizing of information against the framework and uh, the lightening of the process and focusing more the protection monitoring to the framework on how to contribute to analysis was very supporting and was doable, even if not having a full team of IMs. Um, so just, a, just an example of why for me it was important to share. But uh, before any comment or question, I know I don't want to call out some colleagues, but uh, I know the colleagues from Afghanistan, they were doing a similar exercise and they are thinking about it. The colleagues of Venezuela. So it would be great to share a bit, uh, I don't know, your reflection on this. If you see the possibility of working together on the protection monitoring as guiding the support on the PAU, uh, but over to you colleagues. Alicia. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dorian. This was super interesting. I mean, of course, uh, it's a lot of work and we're just starting with it. Uh, but I think it's interesting because, well, it, in our case, it's a special case because we also have relationship with the protection sector of the Response for Venezuela platform. So it's not a protection cluster, but still we're trying to see how we can standardized protection analysis inside of Venezuela and then also in the region. So having this as an example, uh, it gives me idea because we will do we will have a workshop next month exactly on this. And inside of Venezuela, we're having talks with other NGOs who are already doing protection analysis with different uh, tools. Uh, but I, I mean, it's it's a lot of di to digest, <laughs> but we wanted to understand uh, Basically, what I'm trying to do, we have a new SAG and have like a subgroup in our SAG of organization that can support this, especially those that are already implementing um, protection analysis. So I don't know if it's something that you do with specific organization in South Sudan or just as a coordination team of the cluster and what the role of the our responsibilities are, because what my uh, perception has been here in Venezuela, they have not been involved a lot in all this uh, protection analysis. Not sure if because of the global AOR or what the reason is, but we basically are trying to engage everybody, but it's quite new because at the beginning it was just done as a um, from the coordination team. So I'm just trying to broaden it. So I just wanted to understand with whom you're working with and how that is going in, in South Sudan. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Dorian, over to you. Man. Yeah, so, um, well, of course, uh, like everything that when you want to create something, you need to start with a small group. Um, uh, 
and uh, this was first of all this was put in the protection strategy so the at the coordinator at the time decided that needs to that needs to be done and AORs uh, uh, supported that a uh, protection monitoring system needs to be in place so uh, how long it took them to make that decision before I, I came here I don't know but uh, the, the, so first of all you had the decision uh, yes it took probably about eight months to convince everybody to uh, talk to AOAs, to talk to some of the key protection players, to talk to OCHA, to talk to um, some organizations like REACH, which quite honestly felt threatened by the, that, you know, they are not the sole um, source of information in the country. And of course, talk to cluster members. So that the, the buying part was quite long. Uh, but uh, once uh, we, we, we did get quite a good strong support from UNHCR, even some small little funding from ECHO. So, you know, once you start distributing a little bit of tablets, start, start doing a little bit of trainings, uh, the, the, momentum, the momentum is there. So uh, then we realized that this is going to be much bigger than, you know, that uh, a, a two or three uh, member team can do here. Uh, so we basically established PROMO, the Pro Protection Monitoring Working Group. Uh, the working group consists of uh, 40 members. So just to give you the scale, the protection cluster in South Sudan has 267 members, of which 120 are reasonably active. So about a third of active members are involved in the protection monitoring working group. Um, so that gives that gives uh, gives uh, takes a lot of effort in managing and and you know organizing month monthly meetings. But then it takes a lot of responsibility and buying. Um, you know it kind of spreads spreads the responsibility of what we have won, at, at the end of the day we want to say so there is a much stronger um support to our our results uh so the very very few questions are then being asked once 40 organizations uh, stand behind it uh, of course um most than 80 percent of the documentation and the and the, the the maps and the data and the drafts of the of the advocacy, they need to be done. Uh, in, in, they need to be done by us, so, and then the, they are being reviewed, uh, uh, and and new things pop up. But uh, yeah, so there is a lot of manual work. But as I said, how, however, the 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 fact that those products, when they go out to the donor community, to the people, nobody questions them. They are taken, and they are taken as granted. Uh, so it it has it has value to invest a little bit. Uh, that. So that is our experience. Thank you, Dorian. Um, I know I speak for Dorian, but uh, a little maybe we also organized in the past having peer-to-peer uh, -peer and bilaterals maybe across operation. I think it's a good uh, we we can follow up on that. Um, any other comment or question uh, on Dorian's or in the use of potential monitoring? Just. Uh, so thank you, Dorian, for this. Eh? Thank you very much. Uh, we can share also some of the material on the work. Uh, Dorian already put a link in the chat, but we can follow up. And uh, just to tell you that we're going to have a pilot uh, exercise uh, in South Sudan in the next month and a half that is going to also inform uh, the revision we are doing to the overall HNO process. Uh, we have two things in mind that we found as general challenges. One is not having to rely all the time to on household data, so find a better approach. Uh, and the other, um, trying to find a way where the protection ethical framework or whatever framework we have can really help you in organizing the information. The, the main problem that we have seen is in the organizing part. Um, so uh, very much happy just to open there for other operations that would like to, 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 to have a conversation on this. Uh, we already have some, and uh, so I think that now we have a good Quorum, even to have a joint grouping group, uh, joint group across operations where we can look into this much more prominently. Uh, thank you very much, Dorian, eh, for that. So we are thank almost. You, uh, and, and I'm sorry, apologies. Please. I need to leave because no. uh, we here we if you don't uh, make it to the bus, you get stuck in the office. <laughs> thank you very much, Dorian. Have a thank great you, day. Colin, uh, have a great day. Bye bye. So um, we still have half an hour. Uh, I think you are. Been, it's a long day, so you're tired. So I wanted to suggest uh, uh, if you can 
take five minutes. Uh, I'm gonna uh, want to have your usual conversation at the end. Uh, so can you just go to the Slido? As usual, you just go in the Slido, you put the code, uh, and I basically suggesting a word cloud as usual coming from you or what is your biggest challenge? <laughs> So you can pick more biggest challenges. Uh, I think that I know most of them, but it would be good to put it there uh, so then we can open maybe for a 15, 20 minutes of reflection. And then uh, uh, just uh, we can close up and then uh, go to the next steps and action points. On my side, I will post two minutes just to give you time to enter in the slider and contribute to it. <laughs> Someone put the code. Let me show how does it work. Uh, what is it? Once you enter, oh, I made a mistake. It does. So once you enter, you just you could be able to add a word or more than one answer, and then this will give us the word cloud to just let it reflect together. Uh, what is it? Here you have. Okay, so we have. Four colleagues, time, prioritization, lack of big. <laughs> I love the way that came out very big. Selecting priority risks. Agreement where you are, relationship with you are. Uh, access to data, yes. Lack of secondary data, data of children at risk. Mm -hmm. Amazing, we have around. Lack of data since big issue, coordination with ER, okay, became big as well, sadly. Lack of secondary data. There is also agreement where you are. Give you another minute, and then uh, can you can you still hear me? It's some problem with the computer. Can someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so. Let's start, let's start digging into that. Someone would like to jump in and feel brave to maybe uh, add some comment on coordination with the yard, lack of data and prioritization, the three main, one of the three main things. Someone feel, it's our moment of exchange and it's open house, so. Any colleague? Some of the things we discussed today helped. Kimberly, please. Hi, Francesco, yeah. Uh, basically, on on our end, I I feel like um, they have the dispositions. The the ORs have like the willingness to collaborate and and provide data, but then in the process of actually discuss discussing and actually like engaging and developing or drafting, it's way more difficult to be able to coordinate with them, see what. Um, um, responsibilities to divide. It seems like they give the data and at some point, like they can review what's written, but I think that would be nicer, like to make it a process where we can write together, draft, discuss with their partners, our partners, and make it more like a joint effort um, mm -hmm. in that sense make them feel more involved. I feel like mm -hmm. it's not a lack of interest, but maybe the continuous involvement on understanding the role and the importance of developing a PAU. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that's on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, anyone else would like to add on this? And I know that we had some AUR colleague registered into the session. So if there is any also AUR colleague that would like to intervene, that would be amazing. Stephen, please. 
So for me, the coordination is the, the level of responsiveness. So even when you draft, uh, you share it and ask specific questions. Uh, you, the, rev, the response rate is low. You take time to get even a response. Even uh, when you split it to the lowest point and say, OK, out of these issues, what do you select? Can you give me some notes? Can you give this? The, the responsiveness becomes extremely difficult. Uh, we faced this uh, very seriously, and we are trying to navigate it, perhaps the next power, but uh, for now it's been uh, quite challenging. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Stefan. I actually taking notes just I don't want to influence the conversation, so I want to hear from you. Anyone else on? Uh... Francesco, maybe sorry, I'm jumping in. I, I I wrote something in the chat and it's just to under to talk about this on the ERs. And I was thinking, is our PAUs also also promoted by the global AORs? Because if it comes only from the protection cluster, then it's always as asking them to do something more. Yeah. yeah. While if it's also promoted from their global level, then maybe there is a, a support in involving everybody and that they feel that PAUs can be even helpful for uh, the work that AORs are doing in the country. Because I what I also feel now, it's even always more like AORs acting, or at least it's it's like this in Venezuela, acting like another cluster, no? And this, I mean, I have a really good relationship with the coordinators, but when it comes like we are asking you something, it's like, okay, it's like another cluster asking us to for mm -hmm. support. Clear. I will answer in a minute to that, because I don't want to influence the, 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 the exchange. Is there any AUR in the call or colleagues from other sectors? It's, this is a very, we have, so let me, let me start with this. We are having a very, very constructive and useful conversation with the AUR at global level on PAUs and protection analysis. And compared to previous year, we are arriving to very good joint agreements. So, uh, we are really have an opportunity and a space to work better together, and we did that on purpose because we know some of the challenges. So just to say that it is any of our, please feel free to come in because uh, we are very transparent in all the conversation. Um, any other colleagues on that aspect? What would be, what would you need? What would you think would be useful? Alicia, yeah, your question is probably going in that direction. Um, but also it would be great to hear from you since we are at the end of the session. What would you suggest? What would you need from us, from the AUR? So two things that I can comment is, so we we also have to be self-critic. Sometimes we, on our side, we don't anticipate too much the PAU. We don't inform at the very beginning why the PAU is going to use for. So, and also from the global level, we may might have still a bit the idea of, a bit the PAU be threatening because it's our prioritization of risks. But honestly, we are beyond that. So uh, we can anticipate, we can inform better, we can inform in advance. Uh, and I was mentioning at a certain point, I felt the last year sometimes we were involving a UR a bit later on the stage for the challenges we know. Uh, some of you actually, Stephen, uh, Stephen mentioned the responsiveness. Um, but this year feel try doing that more and we're discussing with them more even at global level and one of the things that is happening that we're discussing at our level is that now the, G the PAU are promoted and we have the idea also from the AUR to promote the PAU more than before so um, that's one aspect the second is the PAU were a bit disjoint in our methodology from the use we're going to have with the HNO and you know that we're also working on that so there is much more interest uh, on working together. But those are the things I can share on our side. But uh, over to you, Stefan. Let's be constructive. Just one small example is uh, if, for instance, the CPOR gave you space to make a presentation on the PAU, its value and usefulness during their global AOR meeting where they have all the AOR coordinators participating, and you have this discussion and hear from them, actually, they also give feedback to you saying, look, yeah. how best can yeah. you be involved? What do you want these protection people to do so that you can feel uh, yeah. you own this process? Over. Thank you. Doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. And um, 
not to just go more and on, on just on the coordination where they are. On the other aspect, someone else would like to jump in on the lack of data, lack of data or prioritization. Is there any of the thing we discussed in the last couple of months that you see might help? There is anything else we should do in that front? I know that then bilaterally we're going to discuss, but there is any also suggestion? Let me occupy the space and time, uh, but then I would like to hear from some of you. Uh, a couple of things that we realized, as you know, is that the process that we had and also the process we were promoting on our side on PAU and HNO were separated. So one of the efforts that we've been, and even the GPU. So we had the GPU, the protectionalis update, and the HNO. So one of the things that we're working very, very day in and day on is, as we presented last month, is the linkages. So where the GPU survey that you do in March, in June, and in September, that we will use the severity that is coming out from that, both for the prioritization of risk for the PAU, but also for the severity in the HNO. So we are figuring out on the IM side, so please come back to us so we can discuss in the next month how to do it. But that we thought that when it comes to priority risk, that challenge, this might help because that is going to be a wider conversation. We have some information and so on. And then on the lack of data, we are doing some other uh, work that maybe I comment on afterwards uh, because I see Kimberly raising her hand. Please, Kimberly, come in. Yeah, Francesco, thank you. Um, I think a few comments were, my my comments were in the, on the lack of data. Would be nice also sometimes to understand um, how to use um, secondary data, let's say, I don't know, in the case of the protection cluster, we have the protection monitoring tool, but yeah. then how do you make use of other monitoring tools, um, reliable information, how you integrate without making it seem that there's a lack of data or there's an overload of data. So maybe a bit of guidance on how you analyze something and where to include or where not to include sometimes uh, this data and this information uh, throughout uh, the PAU, honestly, could be in the context or the protection. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes where to look, how to look at data. I feel like sometimes it would be interesting to get like some recommendations or guidance like, okay, now you have this type of information, how you take it and, and, and actually um, implement it in the draft of the PAU. Uh, without making it seem it's a lot or maybe not as reliable as you think it is in terms of like, um, you know, like the source where it's coming from, uh, the timing. Yeah. Sometimes we you only find uh, information uh, regarding specific months. So that's a bit limiting. And if you if it's okay to use that or not or rely on something else. So I think that would be on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Anyone else would like to add uh, or on the same message of Kimberly before I react? Okay, so let me react with two questions of things that we have in mind. Uh, if then can help, if those can help you, Kimberly, but also the other in this specific challenge. One thing we're doing, and I've been working on that for the last month and a half, is mapping information needs against the risks. So try to create for you uh, guidance on when you have the risks or you identify or you prioritize the risk, what is the critical information we need, and also suggesting whether that information should be in a data collection or should come from secondary data or KII. So in our logic, in our logic is, let's say that you do an exercise of prioritizing risks, so you have been agreeing with partners with AUR, you have your five priority risk. Automatically, we are trying to create a tool where you can look at the data, at the information, the minimum information you will need moving forward, that's the data landscape, in order to either verify or reinforce that knowledge about the risks or to fill some gaps of information. Is that, that could that be useful? Because something we're working very heavily and we're working together with the, the AUR and with reach and ETM. So we are really doing this exercise. So one of the goals we had is that any source of information that you have around, it goes back to the risks. So you can use that as category in order to start having a dialogue in terms of data with other operations. Would that work? 
Uh, that's my, 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 one of my questions. And then on the secondary data, there is something that I have seen that we lack sometimes is has been done, for instance, in Burkina. I remember that has been done. I remember an exercise in Myanmar. Maybe, Stephanie, it was you that was on that exercise. And in Afghanistan, where once they prioritized the risks, <coughs> they had a specific workshop with partners and actors in, OK, we have this risk. Who has data? What secondary data is available? So they had a workshop on mapping uh, the, the data sources. That I still feel that is a good exercise to be done once you prioritize the first, the initial risk. Not on all the 15, that's undoable. But after the initial prioritization and our first understanding, doing an effort to sit down, and some of it might be qualitative. So I also understand what is quantitative and qualitative. So sharing those two um, ideas, uh, Kimberly and others, if you think that those are interesting and helpful, and then, other, and uh, so Kimberly, over to you. But then Stephen, I think, I don't know if you want to comment on that exercise in Myanmar. I think he was there. And maybe Gillian, from your experience as ACAPS, if you have any other suggestions. So Kimberly, yes. over to you first. Yeah. Oh, Stephen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, Francesco, I, I think I answered on the chat. I think um, specifically the first um, idea would be great, like to have this guidance of what is the main information. And then we take it from there if then we need to organize, Amazing. let's say, focus groups, discussions, whatever, and have a more one on one um, conversation with specific partners. But I, I do think uh, the first first idea is great uh, for us, at least. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin. Stephen, over to you. Sorry. Yes. So what we did was uh, looking at the protection monitoring uh, data that we had, we selected the top five protection risks then start with the SAG and some partners and said, look, and protection monitoring partners. So the SAG plus protection monitoring partners said, OK, these are the top five we have. We only have quantitative data. And maybe some of you could have additional data that we can use to triangulate. And then so we started mapping uh, who has this data. And then also we had some filters to check for quality, relevance, and all those, all those other, other details. And we, we also assigned partners on who is going to identify that uh, data source. Then we also had the issue of making sure that we reach out to the agencies that have this information to make sure that they are free and uh, allow us to use it. So when, when us, we did the mapping for the five, then uh, we started uh, drafting and then uh, uh, using the same and then we kept going back to double check, but we made sure we triangulate all this information. Yep. Over. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. And one thing that I have a comment: when those exercises are done, sometimes it's helpful to get the buy-in also from your colleagues when you discuss at this stage of the information. So that also might be also one good suggestion that I've seen in other operations. Uh, Gillian, on the secondary, Stephen, please. Sorry, Francesca. Yeah, actually, talking about AOR, so for us, the AORs were involved from the beginning. So they participated. They also provided additional uh, data, additional other, even the qualitative, and they were suggesting how to make sure that this is integrated. Oh. Amazing. Thank you. And Ilian, do you have any suggestion from your ICAPS experience on the question of Kimberly on secondary data and things? Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I came in ACAPS uh, early this year, so uh, um, I dived into the POW directly and fully. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so that I can, I would say I could, uh, I could reach out to uh, uh, more, let's say, experienced. Uh, Colleagues at ACAPS uh, to provide uh, additional information on uh, on how ACAPS is uh, have some tricks and tips for secondary data. Thank you, thank you. So totally understandable. But yeah, you, so sorry. you know what? No, no worries. My, you know what I'm gonna do? I see that another colleague, Frey, is in the call. So maybe Frey, I don't know if you heard the question, but it was on uh, how when we have lack of the lack of data, how do we go about it? Are we understand which secondary data we can use, how we ensure that we have the right amount of it. I don't know if you are, you can hear me, but maybe having your reflection would be great. 
Sorry I to can. Hi, <laughs> sorry. I, I wasn't able to attend most of the session, but um, just jumped on quickly because it was quite interesting. Um, so yes, on secondary data, um, what we're doing, we were piloting a project called uh, Path Deep. Um, so I would urge you to tune into our learning session in 24th or 25th of April, where we're going to share some lessons learned there as well. But basically to give a quick tip, um, what we're doing is we're using an online platform called Deep Data and Exploration Platform, where we are structuring all qualitative data. So any reports that we get for these countries. So let's say for, uh, I don't know, Ethiopia cluster, we are getting you know news articles, we're getting intersectoral reports, sectoral reports, we're getting protection uh, assessments and all these things. So we're basically structuring all that data against the path on this online platform. And then we can extract anything that we need. If we need something from last month, if we need something from last year, if we need something for a specific protection risk. And so this is what we're using to have a qualitative data um, base to triangulate with whatever else is in country. So for example, protection monitoring system or any quantitative assessment. And so um, that's what we're using to support the clusters to really do the qualitative data analysis and to provide basically the qualitative and secondary um, data as a background to any analysis product that needs to be made. So I hope that answers the question. Partially, but I'm going to jump on it, so I'm going to build. Um, one of what is interesting, what we're learning from the support that Trey and colleagues are giving to Mali, Niger, Burkina, uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia, is that, um, of course, to do an exercise of secondary data is that big, you need resources that we don't have. I already know that you don't have those resources, but what is interesting is the logic of having core categories try to bring all those information with those categories. That help the dialogue with the AOAs, the dialogue with other partners. Because it's true, sometimes specifically on protection, that, oh, we need information to understand these risks. Huh? But what information can be all of it? can be everything and nothing. So what we've seen from lessons learned and also what they are testing in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in those five countries, ensuring that we have a minimum of the risks uh, and the broad pillar of the path to be our category to discuss this secondary data mapping. So, and doing this, uh, even during cluster meeting regularly, it's really helpful because then it's not just engaging partner that you are when you draft the PAU, but it's engaging them across the year to discuss together what is missing, what is not missing. So those are just two lessons learned that might work and not work, but, um, uh, very much happy to follow up in bilateral with everyone uh, uh, that would like to have more support on that. So um, is there any other direct comment or question? Otherwise, I see that we are almost at the hour and you are tired. So maybe I just do my usual wrap up with action points and next steps. Can I have some thumbs up from colleagues if it's OK to close or if you have any other comment? Amazing. Um, so just very quickly, uh, we are at the, it was 25th, now it's 27, we are at the PAU session. Um, so in terms of the learning program, uh, the next one uh, will be, there is going to be a switch between the one of the 20, in the 15th of April and the one of the 24th of April. So the next session on the 24th of April is about the legal aid analysis framework. Uh, very much interesting. We are looking into how that framework and that support from the legal and policy task team and RC and the other actor can support you in the PAUs. Extremely interesting. And then it's going to be the session on uh, um, some lessons learned in five, uh, with five operations, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia on how to organize secondary data. Uh, and then be ready for our tour de force uh, in terms of core sessions, uh, specifically for cluster coordination team. Uh, um, that will be uh, running through May. We are deeply, deeply, deeply revising the old methodology to H and OHPC, losing the protection risk prioritization. And um, we have been participating in the GIA workshop last week, and there is going to be a revision on the manual. So I'm, I'm already telling you that we're working with OCHA at global level to include the 15 protection risk in the GIA manual, and also to uh, link better your risk prioritization that they do quarterly with the scope definition of the GF. So uh, we will discuss all of that in May. So those are in very interesting, important sessions that we, we can do together so we can see if we are on the right track. 
Um, having said that, on my end, uh, thank you very much for the timing. In terms of action point, uh, uh, I think that we have to uh, re coordinate well with the AUR to see where we are on the PAU. Uh, so expect more from us. This was already in plan, but I take it as a note as one of my biggest suggestion. Um, and the guidance on data and so on. So we keep you posted on that. Uh, and I take it also as as a suggestion. And then who is interested, we can organize exchange peer-to-peer uh, -peer between operations that are looking at protection monitoring. So as I told you, many of you are doing that. We are, we are working bilaterally, but let us know if you want that to peer-to-peer, -peer, it work much better uh, often than having us intervening. So just reach out, okay? Um, on my side, uh, I really thank you to be there after two hours. I hope it was useful. It was uh, for us an object. Um, uh, yes, that was my thank you. Absolutely. The good uh, good that I received the question because I forgot to say it. Uh, next by Friday or next Monday, I have to ask the communication team. We are going to create a dedicated page in the website with all the recording and all the material of the thematic sessions. So we will share it with you. We will send a communication so you can share it with also partnering countries. And please come back to us if you want to see more information there.